Hi, thanks for joining me today. Um, we're going to do a nice little story on uh, Joe the Animal Barboza. We all know that Joe was one of the most feared hitmen in Boston at the time. Uh, this guy was a bad guy. You know, he ran the streets of the 50s and 60s. Um, Joe was uh, born in 1932 in New Bedford, uh, Massachusetts. Now, we all know that New Bedford, any New Englanders know that it's a big fishing port. And the Portuguese are known to be fishermen. You know, they were good, good people. Um, I had the pleasure of working with them. You know, in my younger days of construction, really hard working people. Uh, Joe came up in, uh, I'd say 13 years old, he had his first arrest, Joe. You know, Joe was nested for the streets. You know, that's the first time he saw Joe was at 13. And his criminal career just kept growing. But there was a time that Joe... Uh, became a professional boxer. I mean, this was a big guy. He was a big man and a tough guy. And I think he had 11 professional fights. His father was also a fighter, so he tried to follow in his footsteps. But the allure of the streets were too much for Joe. So when Joe was up in Boston, he used to hang on Brooks and Bennington Street in East Boston. And uh, at that time, it was a big influence there of La Cosa Nostra, organized crime. Um, Joe came up, he put a crew together, and uh, Joe was deeply into uh, extortion, brutality, hitman. But his big occupation was loan shocking. That's where he was making most of his money. And I got a little clip, and we're going to talk about that after. So let's go to that clip and uh, let Joe, let's just see uh, Joe's character. And this will tell you a little more about Joe and how ruthless this guy really was. So let's go to the clip. I'll be right back. About his life as a hired killer. Tonight, the focus is on loan sharking, one of the mob's main sources of income in Barboza's time. And now here's Ron Golubin. Matt, no one knew loan sharking better than Joseph Barbosa, or Baron, as he was also called. This 1970 interview with him provides a look into the world of loan sharking through the eyes of someone who lived it. Joseph Barbosa's corner in East Boston was a magnet for desperate people who needed money fast and couldn't get it elsewhere. Interest, or vigorous, was high, and the collection methods were low. But Barbosa claimed he always warned the customers first. We made the deal. I tell every person, don't take this money. If you can't pay it every week, I prefer you not take this money because it can lead you into trouble. If a customer did take the money and couldn't pay it back, there was trouble. This was, this is was almost typical. If a guy was seven weeks late, say in the area of six, six or seven weeks late, and he was hiding, and I found him, I said, I threatened him, and he, and I told him that <laughs> you better come down to the corner and straighten this up. Now the fellow would continue hiding because he didn't have the money, and I could not, I could not like uh, uh, accept, I could not let myself accept that. Uh, uh, he was in trouble. So that uh, I stabbed guys after 14 weeks that still continue to hide. You know, I stabbed them in the face, I stabbed them in the legs, I stabbed them in the arms, I stabbed them in the chest. You understand? Barbosa and other loan sharks justify this kind of treatment on the basis of the deal. And surprisingly, they say even the recipients of the violence agreed. See, most of these people, the ones that I heard, knew that I was right. Maybe I was wrong in the way that I did it, you know, as far as the ex excess violence that I did it, but still they said that they deserved it. 
they didn't relish it, but they knew as far as the deal itself, they were wrong. The money made on loan sharking is enormous. For example, Joe Barbosa had just one corner and one section of East Boston. It grew up to $5,500 a week. Interest. How much money did you have out to get $5,500 a week? Well, I was a little lucky. I had only had about 65000 I had one man that uh, I gave 21000 to, and he used to give me $1,800 a week. Be gone. <laughs> there are some freelance loan sharks, but very few successful ones. The successful sharks are soon paid a visit and are usually made an offer they can't refuse. You start out with $1,000. Yeah, I didn't need nothing, right? Once you start making... Uh, some good money. That's when they step in on you and say, listen, we'll be able to write to Shylock. Shylock belongs to, you know, <coughs> to the office. And you've been doing Shylock for a long, long time. Excuse me, Joe, what do you mean by the office? To the office, in other words, it goes around you. They wait till you make some money. Then they say, all right, we're your partners. We want 50% of your business. Any trouble that you have, we'll take it. You don't have to hit nobody. You don't have to do this. They didn't do that. What do you mean hit? I mean, anybody, you know, what, what they use, what they use, if they hit you, uh, you know, slap you, stab you, hit you with a, some kind of an implement, or, uh, I'm going to tell you something. If anybody died from Sherlock, it would be a $90 customer. <laughs> it won't be a $5,000 customer, because that doesn't get you. Now, Joe had 65000 he claimed on the street, and he was collecting $5,500 a week. Well, let me tell you, I, at my peak had 16, 650,000 on the street. And I was collecting maybe seven, 8,000 a week on an average. I had to give my guys, the May guys and my associates that were close to me, I used to give the May guys uh, money at a point. So that means if I gave them a thousand dollars, they gave me $10 a week on that thousand. My close associates, I gave at two points because they were given all money. They were low shocking in their neighborhoods. So I averaged between one or two points. When Joe started loan shocking, I, he had to be given enough for astronomical money for him because that's almost 10 points a week. I mean, he must have had guys at five points, seven points, eight points. So Joe was earning, and believe me, they were paying Joe. But you see in the conversation that even as bad as Joe was in his reputation of him being a murderer and a tough guy and he would definitely hurt you. You heard what he said. He'd stab you, bite you in the face. He would do anything to hurt you, Joe. He was a bad guy. Um, this guy was ruthless. And still people didn't pay him. See, I had a lot of problems uh, with loan shock money, too. I mean, I was giving a lot of money to these bookmakers who owe me 20000 40000 80000 A lot of these guys were going bad, you know, and there was really no way to collect the money. And like Joe said... You heard a $90 guy. So on my day, it would be heard a $1,000 guy. You don't hurt a $20,000 guy if you want to make a point, a point out of it. But I wasn't that ruthless. I was more of a businessman. I gave people breaks. You know, I had a guy owe me $80,000. He's giving me uh, $2,400 a week for over a year. I got my money back or more. And when he went bad and he couldn't pay, I put him on the shelf. Because that's what you have to do in this business. That's what you had to do in the 90s. You know, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, you can get away with a lot. Go after a bus driver now. Give him $1,000. Go after him. Crack him in the head and you see how fast he goes to the law. A mailman. You know, any of these people today. A factory worker. They're going to go right to the law today. There's only a few honorable people left out there that you can work with. That's why I don't believe on a street level that loan shotguns are good business anymore. But I made a lot of money with it. But like I said, that was back in the 90s. So let's talk a little more about Joe and his crew. You know, Joe was causing havoc in the neighborhoods. Uh, the wise guy started to get fed up with him. The Patriarca family. Raymond was fed up with him. Larry Bioni, Jerry and Julo. Um, I think he was getting to a point of just being a freelancer at this point. He was killing for the mob, collecting money for the mob, enforcing for the mob. Sometimes these guys think they get bigger than the mob and they have their own little faction. And, you know, and he had a lot of bad guys with him. 
Uh, one of them was uh, Nicky Femia. We're going to talk about him afterwards and something that he was involved in. But Nicky was a bad guy and a murderer. A lot of people feared him. But I got a little story about him that we'll talk about later. I want to get back to the clip, okay? Because in 1966, Joe gets picked up on a weapon charge, Joe Barboza, and he needed 100000 in bill, and his guys were all collecting money. They were going to everybody, um, whoever they could grab, grab the money from them. They went to, uh, they were called to go to the Nightlight in the North End. Now, the Nightlight was a club in the North End restaurant that uh, was owned by Larry Bioni. Larry Bioni was a head cop in the city. Uh, Larry Zanino, we could call him. And uh, they went to Larry's club. And when they went into the club, it was an ambush. So when they entered the club, they killed those two henchmen. Arthur and Tommy DePrisco. Now, these two guys were killed. They put them in Arthur's car in the trunk. And they took the car to South Boston and dumped it over there. When they did that, uh, they want that everybody to think that, you know, a lot of think that they had a beef with the Irish over there and they clipped them and they stuck them in the trunk. That's why they dumped them over there. Uh, but I mean, also the wise guys, someone dropped a dime. Now, this is the story I heard on the street that the Lord went to the, the nightlight, the Larry's joint, and they caught uh, Rafi Chong, Johnny Chicotti, and a few associates cleaning up the blood. Now, I don't know how true the story is. This is what I heard on the street. So these are one of those street stories. I don't want no one to come back at me with that, but I'm pretty sure it went down like that, you know? So now Joe Bob Bowles is in prison. This is a notorious hit, man. Now, let me tell you, when Joe Bob Bowles walked in Walpole and other state prisons, everybody feared him. He was probably the most feared guy at that time in the prison system because Joe would come right after. He was the boss in there. There was no doubt about that. You know, and, um, you know, Joe's facing this time. They just clipped two of his guys. They clipped another guy, another guy of his that year. June knew, June knew that it was over for him. So to get back at the Petriaca family, he flipped. He became a governor of a farmer. By 1970, Joe was already in the program. And this tape that I'm showing you from uh, Channel 5 was an interview we did in 1970. So I want to play the rest of that interview for you, then we'll come back. Tomorrow, Barbosa will define the structure of New England organized crime and name the leaders, the same people the government claims still rule the underworld. Barbosa will also tell why he decided to become an informer, a decision that ultimately cost him his life. In 1970 interview, Joseph Barbosa defined the structure of the New England mob. Barbosa's position as a contract killer required direct contact with the man said to be the boss of the New England crime syndicate. Raymond Patriarca. Now imagine, like, Raymond sits in Rhode Island. This ashtray is Rhode Island. And this is, oh, that's the middle of a wheel. And all these folks run out, lines of them into, into Worcester, into Springfield, into Boston, and, and all these different uh, uh, cities and suburban towns. Now, when that, when the lines go there, he has an office there, the main office in each town or city. Now, in that main office, there might be 25, uh, in a, a 25 chartered clubs or bars, more than that, in, in that city, that all turn back to that main office. Now, the main office sends somebody back towards Raymond, and at a certain point, not directly to Raymond, but to somebody Raymond Truss is just outside of Rhode Island, picks up that money and, and brings it to Raymond, and you got all these people, you know, you understand what is developing from the, this main artery that thousands and thousands of people that he controls and we have bookmakers and so forth, and, and uh, the runners and so forth, and pickup men, and uh, gambling is, uh, you know, re, re, you know, they're not wrong in regards to uh, the, the five cent or three cent uh, number money. You understand that, you know, when it deals in volume, brings it back millions and millions and billions of dollars a year. The indictments last week against Boston's alleged mafia leaders confirm that such structure still exists as described by Barboza, and that Raymond Patriarch of Providence, Rhode Island, is the boss of that syndicate. 
Barbosa described the simple way that members of the syndicate are identified to each other. Joe, Joe, this is Jim. Uh, Jim is our friend. Uh, Jim, Joe is our friend. You understand? Or they'll say, uh, they never, if there's somebody that's not connected, they never say our friend. I want you to meet so and so. It was some of these same so-called friends who double-crossed Barboza and caused him to turn informer and to go on to become the most important witness against the mob ever. Here, he reads from an undelivered letter to Patriarca, citing his reasons for doing so. They killed Tash and Tommy DePrisco in the nightlight. They took off their person's money totaling over $70,000, which belonged to me and the guys at the bail killed Chico on December 7th, 1966. Raymond sent word to me that if I go to his office and straighten it out, then nothing would happen to my wife and child. They did plot and try to kill my wife and child. The office tried to kill my brother. They tried to kill my wife's cousin, Sid. <coughs> they turned journey of mine against me, and he was opening letters I was sneaking out through him and letting them read them. The office spread the rumor that they were mad at me for shaking certain people in nightclubs down, even though I never moved on any club or person until the office gave me the okay, I only answered to Raymond and his emissary. At first it used to reach me, the informant in Canary Bay. It doesn't reach me anymore because I have a purpose in life. I have only one purpose, and that is uh, the best way I can put it is uh, to get a little peace of mind. That peace of mind lasted about five years. The mob had the last word. On February 11, 1976, Barboza was gunned down in the streets of San Francisco. Last week, two reputed gangsters in Boston, Gennaro Angelo and Ilario Zanino, were arrested and charged with plotting Barboza's murder and that of two of his friends. So now Joe Barboza becomes one of the top performers in the country for the government. And in the course of doing this, he framed six men for Teddy Deegan's murder. A few of them were Joe Savati, who we call Joe the Hoss, and Peter Lamoli, and several others. And uh, he framed them on this murder, knowing that uh, Jimmy Flemmy actually murdered this guy. Deegan was, Deegan was one of his friends, and he wanted to get back at everybody, but he wasn't going to flip on uh, Jimmy Flemmy. So he involved all these other people in this murder. And Peter Lamoli and Joe Savati, uh, thank God I was still out when he came home, Joe the Hoss. He was a great guy, back with his family. You know, had a beautiful family. Peter Lamoli, you know, I knew his children. Uh, Paul and Peter, they're great people. Um, raised really well. And uh, Peter came home. He ended up getting back into organized crime and became the boss of the Petriaca family. But these poor men were in prison for over 30 years for something that they didn't do and a murder they didn't commit. You know, at that time, the FBI... You know, they were just going after all these guys who wanted to knock them down, guilty or not. The problem with them, if you're guilty for one thing, they'll get you on something else. That's how the government works. Whether it's true or not, this is how they operate. And unfortunately, these guys got the bad end of it. So in Joe's career, they set up Joe in San Francisco. They sent him to culinary school. I guess he was going to open a restaurant. But Joe Cena was wide open over there in San Francisco. And uh, he started going back on the streets. They accused him of killing one man and maybe two men in San Francisco. He was arrested over there. He did some time on some charges. He got out in 1975. At that time, you know, the Boston La Cosa Nostra knew where he was and contacted an associate. So Barboza went to a meeting. When he came out of the meeting, J.R. Russo, who was, was a captain before he passed away in Boston in the 90s, in the 80s, uh, jumps out of the uh, van with another associate from Boston and pumps four shots from a shotgun into Barboza, and Barboza was killed. Barboza himself is still a legend in the Boston area, still a legend for the things that he did. You know, a shame, it's a shame, um, his character, what he did, how we frame these people, but he was a ruthless killer. So what did he care about anybody? You know, and a lot of good guys went to prison for nothing at that time, but thank God some of them made it out. They were able to get back with their families. 
Uh, I really don't have anything good to say about Joe Bob Oza. Like I said, that wasn't my era, the 50s and the 60s. I didn't really start coming around these guys till the 70s when I was a young kid, you know, and then eventually into my uh, teenage years. But I did have a run-in with a lot of his people and a lot of the guys around him, and I knew a lot of people that knew Joe. And I've heard a lot of stories about him. There was one story I heard about him. Now, I don't remember the brothers' names. But he laid on them for three days. This is the type of guy that, that Joe was. I don't know if it was the Bennett brothers, Bennett brothers. I, I don't know what it was. But they were also laying on him for two days. And Joe said he outlasted them. So he was at their house when they got home. He got out of his car. He killed the both of them. This guy is willing to sit in a car for three days and wait for you. All right. So this guy was a bad guy. This guy was a hitman. This is what he did. So you can't take nothing away from this guy. You know, he had heavy ties with uh, went the Hill Gang, Stevie Fleming, Jimmy, uh, the Bear Fleming. So he had, he had ties with all these people. He was in there right in the inner circle. But he can never be a main guy, which he wanted to be. So I think what he did at the end was starting to branch out on his own. Believing he didn't need the mob anymore. And that was the result of this. His three friends getting killed. Four friends getting killed, actually. And uh, Nicky Femia in prison. Now, let me tell you about Nicky Femia. He was younger then. He was his associate. He was in that crew with him. Um, there was a murder here, the Black Fire murders in 19... Uh, 78, I believe it was. They killed five people. It was a bad drug deal. Went bad. And um, the drug deal goes bad. They blamed uh, Robert Italiano, Bobby, which was a friend of mine. Billy Ayarati, I think, was involved in that. And Nicky Femio. Now, if anybody was the shooter out of that crew, it would have been Nicky Femio. So now it's the early 80s. I buy my first building in East Boston. I bought a three-family building on... Princeton Street in East Boston, 38 Princeton Street. When I first bought the building, I wasn't living in there. I had all the apartments rented out. And I had my friend, uh, Armando Mickey Felizzi. And he was a close friend. I love Mickey. And uh, he was living on the top floor, tenants on the second floor, tenant on the first floor. Now, Nicky Femia came home. He was like a scourge, this guy. He was a scumbag. He was on drugs. He was robbing the drug dealers, shaking people down. I heard he was going at the people's houses, tying them up, taking their money, taking their drugs, whatever he was, they tie up your whole family, this kid. It was no good at the end, you know? And um, so now I'm going back and forth on my building, you know, to fix something, pick up rent, whatever I was doing. And I kept catching him around the building. Now he was friends with Mickey. And I talked to Mickey about it. You know, he, I don't believe that he was going there because of Mickey. Mickey told me that. And um, he did have him over a few times. Come to find out, the girl on the first floor was giving him drugs, giving him cocaine. I go knocking on the door and go yelling at her, and she's telling me that, um, you know, I knew her father was a drug dealer. I found out then, and I guess he was shaking the father down, so Nikki was giving the cocaine to Cheryl, and she was passing it on to Nikki Femia. And I was livid over this. And I went upstairs and I, you know, before I moved in and I talked to Mickey, I said, Mickey, listen, you know, I'm 21, 22 years old. My violence at that time was maybe a few bad fights and beating a few people up, getting in a few altercations, maybe a knife here and there, but nothing to the extent of killing somebody. But I don't know if I just feared him or whatever the problem was at that time. I knew his reputation. I didn't want him in my building. I was ready to move my wife and child in there. And I was willing to kill this guy over that because I didn't want him around. So long story short, I asked Mickey a few times. I said, Mickey, come on, call him on the phone at night. Tell him to come over. I wait in the stoop or something downstairs around the corner, whatever. You know, in an alley, in a doorway. As soon as he turns the corner, I'm going to hit him in the head. And then I'm going to take off. I'll park my car around the corner, jump in my car, and I'll go to another destination. So I asked Mickey twice to do this. That didn't turn out. So when, when I moved in the building, I locked the front door so we couldn't get inside the building. And I told Mickey, I'm sure Mickey said something about that, that I didn't want him at the building anymore. I'm in my backyard one day. And I'm coming out from the alley. 
And who do I see at the top of the stairs? Now, my building on Princeton Street, I ran that stairs like 12 steps to get to the platform. And right there was the first floor window. And I see Nikki Femia knocking on the window. What are you doing here? Oh, I'm going to see. She says, no, you're not. This, this is over with now. Come on, get out of here. Now, he was at the top of the stairs. And there was another guy at the bottom of the stairs. Scrawny looking kid. Looked like a junkie. But I seen Nikki had an old T-shirt on. Black dress pants and scuffy shoes. And I seen and I looked. I didn't see a gun. So I had a little more balls when I didn't see that. I didn't have nothing on me either. But, you know, I was a big kid then, you know, when I was doing my own things and I wasn't going to take any shit from this guy. But I got to be honest with you, I was shitting myself a little. So whatever words went back and forth, he really didn't want to argue with me. He turns, he looks at me, starts walking down the stairs. He walks down the stairs and turns and he starts coming towards me. And I think there's going to be an altercation at this point. But what does Nicky do? He walked right past me and he walked right past his associate walked right past me. And believe me, I was relieved when that happened. So I stood on the bottom step in my house. I saw him go around the corner. Now Nikki's gone. I did have a gun upstairs because I thought he was going to come back. You know, I didn't know what he was going to do. But shortly after that, um, he got shot up at Jeffrey's Point. Friends of mine had an auto body shop up there. Actually, I was doing work with them. I was keeping some lumber in there and some of my equipment. And I didn't know Nicky was going in and out of there bothering one of the brothers shaking him down. Like I said, he was shaking down everybody. The other brother, I don't know if his name was Richie or Ron, he walks in. He's in the auto body shop and he killed him right there execution style. And then Nicky was dead. So that was a problem to me that was out of the way because I never wanted a confrontation with the guy. But I couldn't have that guy come into my building with my wife and kid in there. He was capable of doing anything. I mean, I'm sure he knew my father and knew I was a Luisi. You know, and maybe that's why I got lucky that day. He just walked past me. But like I said, he didn't have a gun on him, you know, and I could have put my hands on him right there. And thank God I didn't, because he would have definitely came back if I did that. <laughs> so these are just lessons learned. But I hope you enjoyed the show today. Um, I just wanted to do a little on Joe, show you that tape. You know, there's a lot more to talk about with him. You know, I got I to tell you a story. Like I said, I never met the guy. I was too young. But my father, Santo, uh, worked in the Airways Cafe on the, on the corner of Maverick and Franklin Street in East Boston. And Joe used to go in there once in a while. My mother cooked there. That's how she met Santo. God bless. And uh, Joe used to love my mother's eggplant and her galamad and everything else that she made. So Joe would always compliment the food. So like I said, Santo knew Joe. I told you Santo was a street guy. And uh, yeah, that's the closest I ever got to Joe Barbosa. So I just thought I'd share this story. Now, later on, after his murder, they arrested uh, Larry Zanino, uh, Larry Bioni, and uh, Jerry Angelo on setting up the murder. So, I mean, this guy caused a lot of problems in the family. It took a lot of people down. But it took uh, Joe Russo's balls to go over there and pump four into him. This is when the mob and the Patriarca family were at their strongest. And no one realizes Raymond's power through New England and even into New York, how well he respected he was there. But uh, this is just another gangster story. I'm glad you listened today, and I hope you enjoyed it. So God bless, and we'll be back on more shows for you. Thank you.